Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. It's uh, great that we've had so many register um, their interest on this topic, and it's no surprise. My name is uh, Dr. Praveen, and I am an ERA educator at IAL. I also run Surge Consulting, where, where we provide learning solutions that focus on uh, inclusion, connection, and collaboration very much related to today's topic on learner engagement. About a year ago, many of us as uh, seasoned trainers or even new trainers were, were forced by COVID to go fully online with our courses. And at that time, there was a desperate scramble for technical skills. And now that a year later, many of us have uh, te technical skills more or less under control, um, this other issue of learner engagement, which we all know is so important, has really uh, risen to the surface. How can we get it right as trainers? How can we address learner engagement? So this afternoon, we have a, a carefully selected panel of speakers, um, selected for their expertise um, coming from diverse areas. So we have uh, Dr. Bi Xiaofang, who is a senior researcher at IAL. And Xiaofang has years of experience um, doing educational research. So she looks at classroom interaction, pedagogy, and professional development. And luckily for us, she's also researching in the topic of learners' sense-making so that um, we have a better idea of how learners make sense, and that will inform our own pedagogical innovations as we work with either fully online or blended learning. So uh, besides Xiaofang, we've got Dr. Daniel Xia. So a law lecturer at SUSS. Uh, Dr. Daniel is also an expert in adult learning, and um, he is a recipient of the SUSS Teaching Excellence Award. So to have won that award, I'm sure he's got loads of tips to share uh, with us this afternoon. And then finally, joining us from industry is Mr. Pambudi Sunarsi Hanto, who is the HR Director at Bluebird Group. And he is an author of uh, uh, leadership to do with leadership. And he also has an established um, record in leading HR function and business transformation across a range of industries. Um, th um, these would include um, finance, financials like Citibank, and then there's also telecoms, etc. So he'll be joining us as the third speaker this afternoon. Yeah. So uh, I think without further ado, we can launch into the wisdom um, of this exciting research that Xiaofang has been doing. Xiaofang, over to you, please. Thanks, Barbie. Sorry. OK, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thanks uh, for taking some time to join us today for this uh, sharing session. So uh, this afternoon, I will talk about how to engage learners in online learning from the research perspective. Yeah, so firstly, I would like to um, introduce the two concepts, online learning and the learner engagement. So what is online learning? Uh, when we talk about online learning, uh, it sounds quite, sometimes quite interchangeable with e-learning. However, according to research, that uh, there are some differences. E-learning focuses more on, more on the technological tools used, like uh, internet or even the PPT you used can make your learning a bit, 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 bit like uh, e-learning. Uh, however, the online learning is more focusing on the learning opportunities and the experiences. For example, in classroom, we have the traditionally like a teacher dominated classroom learning. And in online learning, especially uh, in those uh, asynchronous online learning, we have more like self-directed learning. And then within online learning, we also need to differentiate between synchronous and asynchronous online learning. For synchronous uh, uh, online learning, it's more like uh, it, it's, it's more like real time uh, learning with uh, some fixed schedule. In contrast, asynchronous learning tend to be uh, not, not so much real time. It, it has flexible schedule and then the learners can have access to this learning at any time at their convenience. And this asynchronous online learning uh, can form always a part of the blended learning. Okay, so <clears throat> so this uh, concept of uh, we, 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 we need to clear uh, be clear about this online learning. Yeah, 
And then what is learner engagement? When we talk about learner engagement, why we use learner engagement uh, as a measure of the quality of the learning? Because it reflects the quantity and the quality of learners' participation in the course or even every other aspect of their educational program. Yeah, so uh, it includes the learner's participation, interaction, cooperation with their uh, peers and their instructors. So learner engagement is really a measure of the potentially whether this is a successful learning experience by everyone, for everyone concerned. So for, for uh, an engaged learner, we have a few indicators like uh, they are active in their learning. For example, they, they tend to pose questions and ask clarifications during their learning, and they're eager to participate in the learning activities. And then they have the agency to spend some effort to explore further about their learning. They are motivated and inspired to link, to link what they have learned, for example, in classroom with their life experiences or work experiences. So all these are the features of the uh, engaged learner. However, so uh, I, I uh, take some findings from a most recent research uh, by AL on adult learners' perception of online learning due to COVID-19. We know that uh, especially during this pandemic, there are lots of benefits for this online learning, safe traveling time, you can maintain social distancing and spend more time to take care of your family members, and especially for asynchronous learning, have more accessible and flexible um, learning resources for our learners. However, there are definitely some a lot of frustrations for this online learning, uh, particularly in terms of the uh, learner engagement. For example, uh, we noticed that both the facilitators and le learners may not have the enough IT literacy to deal with uh, this sudden conversion from, from classroom to online learning. They, they, they are struggling to, to adapt to this le new learning mode. And secondly, the technology we're using, not all of them are very user-friendly. It's quite a lot of frustration. We need to spend lots of time to figure out. So this does affect the quality of this learner engagement. And uh, especially during adult education, we have a lot of like uh, hands-on skills teaching. So how can we improve the efficiency of this hands-on skills, uh, practical aspect of learning in adult education? Online learning may be a little bit uh, in the way, not so efficient as those face-to-face -face demonstration. Okay, another common complaint from the learners, like uh, I'm sitting in behind the screen alone. Uh, I even cut off my uh, videos and uh, mute myself. It's like just I'm, I'm in my own world to do the learning. So there are not much interaction between the facilitators uh, and learners or even among the learners themselves. They, 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 the interactions are, are also a challenge, challenge part, challenging part for this uh, online learning. And you know that uh, a lot of this kind of online learning promise that at the end of the session, we'll provide the recorded video. So it may cause some learners to lose their attention during the learning because they know that they can review the video after the session. Yeah. And then uh, we also notice the some curriculum design and the teaching methodologies are uh, used in this online learning also doesn't encourage some high quality of learner engagement. So next, I want to showcase some online learning challenges from um, uh, recently complete study by IL uh, regarding learners' uh, learning experience in blended learning. I chose a case of uh, blended learning with uh, uh, asynchronous online learning as, uh, as a component. So in, in this course, the, the, uh, the expected learning outcome for the learner is to equip them with in-depth knowledge of how these kind of SAP and ERP systems support the business op operations uh, uh, within the enterprise. And then at the end of the course, the learners are expected to become a SAP uh, financial consultant. And the course structure is comprised of 80% of e-learning and 20% of uh, flipped classroom lecture face-to-face -face sessions. However, at the end of the session, the learner share with us that they, uh, their engagement in the course uh, are not as uh, what they, they expected because they, they think that uh, even though they learn the ebook knowledge, which is very essential for this kind of job role, they still cannot apply it uh, to their real, uh, real case job scenarios, which means that the, the, they are not really uh, inspired and motivated to, to, to uh, explore further regarding that how they can link this uh, theory with their practices. So we are trying to dig out why such things, such experience by the learners. Yeah, so we look at uh, the curriculum design of this course. 
which actually discouraging discourages learners engagement in a way like uh, they didn't provide incorporate the versatility of this uh, SAP ERP system and how it can be applied in different uh, authentic settings to make to motivate the learners to apply what they have learned and uh, at the same time learners doesn't have the uh, opportunities to understand to have a deep understanding of the possibilities of application and also they are not encouraged to spend more effort to explore the these possibilities when we look at the supports for this kind of uh, learning in this course, we notice that it's particularly on the online learning, uh, no matter for the pedagogical support or for the technical support, I think uh, it could be the, the, the reasons for this kind of frustration for their engagement. For example, for the uh, pedagogical support, uh, the, the learners encourage, uh, encounter a lot of challenges during this asynchronous learning, uh, their self-directed learning. However, they don't receive sufficient or uh, should support after this kind of session uh, to, to support them to address these problems. So it, it caused their engagement of the learning could, couldn't go uh, further and deeper. And then for the technical support, even though we call this learning as a uh, synchronous uh, uh, online learning, however, it's very rigid due to some technical uh, problems and also license problems. The learner can only have access to these uh, learning online learning materials in a very rigid specific period of time. They cannot have access all the time. So that means even if they want to review and revisit content uh, throughout the uh, duration of the course, they cannot do that. Only that within that one month or one week. So all these uh, technical uh, uh, issues uh, in the infrastructure of this online learning is also a challenge for better uh, to, to achieve the better learner engagement. So now we can have some reflections from this research like, um, uh, like Pramit has mentioned, during the pandemic, a lot of us are forced to convert to online learning because of this uh, social distancing or pandemic. So uh, at this post-pandemic time, what could, what could we do to prepare us better for any unexpected disruptions in the future? How can we address these challenges and make us to be better prepared? So um, from the research, I would like to provide some uh, 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 some tips uh, like uh, what research has recommended us to do to uh, overcome these challenges. For example, this kind of professional development for practitioners about regarding their IT literacy should be continuous. It, it shouldn't be just because of the pandemic, we need to pick up these skills. We should have the continuous training for this kind of uh, IT literacy of our practitioners, especially among the practitioners. Some of them are more proficient. This kind of sharing are also sh should be encouraged. And then regarding the curriculum design, how can we improve the practical aspect of learning? From, from my own uh, uh, teaching experience, like um, we may need to include more like real uh, authentic case studies in our online learning to help the learner better link the practice, uh, the theory and the practice to further their engagement in their learning and improve the quality of their learning outcome. Uh, regarding the teaching methodologies, because my, I myself as a researcher, I also, also conducted some uh, uh, um, uh, teaching sessions. I noticed that uh, when people are sitting behind the screen, it, it's, it's difficult to, to encourage the interactions among themselves. So uh, it's some teaching methods, some activities should be designed very uh, crafted, very carefully. So uh, for myself, I, I will design very engaging group work with those very thought provoking discussion. I even encourage every one of them to present their discussion with the whole class. So that means they are not sitting alone. They are still have the same feeling in like the face-to-face -face classroom. Like we can still sharing and then still uh, communicating with each other. As the facilitator, yeah, we, we, we should avoid dominating the, the, the conversation like in some traditional classroom, like I, I'm telling you what to do. I, 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 I want to be more like a listener and then ask the, the learner, especially adults, to share their rich life and the work experience during their learning, which they can learn each other. So this kind of uh, atmosphere could be created through some crafted teaching methodologies. And also uh, after this kind of, especially asynchronous learning, we should, um, as a training provider or adult educator, we, we may need to consider to to put in more effort to follow up with their challenges. Like uh, we can follow up uh, some, uh, have some follow up this uh, communication with them through like email or some other platforms to address their challenges uh, 
uh, in due time to make sure that they can uh, continuously engage in the high quality of uh, learning. They are motivated and inspired to explore more. And lastly, I know that uh, we cannot make sure that all the learners are the same, right? They have different profile, especially for those uh, sort of uh, less uh, self-disciplined learners. I encourage that we could incorporate some proper uh, like assessment uh, SOPs. For example, uh, we know that uh, we can uh, uh, encourage them to make some live uh, a video and the video uh, video recordings and uh, send in uh, as the assignment for, for assessment. So this can, uh, on the one hand, to ensure the integrity of the assessments because this kind of video you need to take in one time, you cannot take it several times. And then we can also motivate those uh, less uh, self discipline discipline learners, if without such assessments, they may lose attention during the learning. And so that better uh, encourage them engagement in this whole learning process. So yeah, this is just a brief sharing from my uh, research uh, uh, experience. Yeah, I know that other panelists may have a lot more interesting stories to share with the audience today. And actually, I'm also quite open for, for any uh, questions and inputs and feedback. And then uh, we, we are very glad to, to discuss with all of you here. Yeah, so that's the end of my uh, sharing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Xiaofang. Um, it's amazing the, the things that your, your last slide lists you have. Could, could, we, could we look at the recommendations once more? Yeah, and I, I, looking at uh, this rich list, I'm amazed because, you know, uh, even the questions that um, that um, came in and I'm going to post one now because I'm just uh, plucking questions that came in earlier. Some of the uh, registrants sent in the questions earlier. Yeah. And there is this question, for example, on any tools being available. And I yeah. think IEL has done a fantastic job over the last year amassing tools and running courses that um, help adult educators learn how to use the tools. So my question is, if you look, and, and I think we can, Xiafang, we can maybe you can share about the tools um, in a bit, right? My question is, you look at the one, two, three, four, five, um, they're, yeah. all, they're all about really, um, they're, they're new skills. They're not just new tools, they're new yeah. skills. What do you think mm -hmm. about that? You know, the uh, new skills that adult educators must learn, skills that we may not, have learned already before? Uh, I won't say that these are really uh, uh, purely new skills. Mm. Uh, we may use them here and there uh, unconsciously, but mm -hmm. uh, for this online learning, uh, I, I would like to highlight these skills, whether you have it or whether you, you have it very strongly or, or a little bit weakly. I mean, we, uh, these are the necessary skills Mm -hmm. for those better learner engagement. It is not purely uh, very, very new to, to those experienced uh, ed educators or training providers, but we may put some more attention mm -hmm. to train these skills to enable the better learner engagement, uh, especially in this kind of online learning environment. Because I'm self, uh, not only a researcher, I'm also like a practitioner in terms of delivering uh, some teaching, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I had this kind of frustration also. Yeah, so uh, for myself, I, I, I know these skills, but how can I highlight or, or mm -hmm. strengthen these skills during the delivery of, of this mm -hmm. online learning so that I can make sure all my learners are, are not like uh, just sitting behind the screen and listening to my, my like uh, whatever story they feel. Mm. I want them to be uh, like participative and enjoy, uh, enjoyful in this kind of learning. And then at the end, they also can bring back certain things they can use, they can apply. So this, I mean, I mean this for adult education is, yeah. is quite essential. Yeah. So I think we have the tools and I think we need to pivot the skills that we use naturally in a classroom to yeah. a virtual space. You know, how yeah. do you interact? How do you ask questions? How long do you wait before somebody answers? All yeah. these things become, uh, they're slightly different online. So we'll have to polish those skills, I think, yeah? Yeah, yes, you're right, polish. Yeah, how can we polish? <laughs> so Xiafang, before we go off to uh, Daniel, yeah. Uh, yeah. did you want to say something about the tools in case in case some people in um, listening, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, you want me to share the websites or? 
Actually, well, maybe uh, you could just tell them where they could find. Uh, yeah, I mean, they can go to the IAL uh, website under uh, Start Learning uh, Innovation. Actually, IAL uh, works uh, works very closely with SSG and IMDA to compile uh, and also develop some of the tools, a, a list of uh, 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 very resourceful tools for our practitioners to use and experience. Yeah, for myself, I didn't use all of them, but I I I definitely believe this is a very good. Resource of list for 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 all our practitioners to refer to, yeah. Okay. So it's all in our websites. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much, Yafang. Welcome. Um, and thanks for sharing. I love this recommendations. It's a very rich list there. Yeah. Daniel, we're about to um, listen to your wisdom. Uh, we're hoping that you will connect with Yafang and build upon and explore new stuff around engagement. Yeah. So all yours, please. Thank you very much, Paveen. Uh, good afternoon to everyone who's just joined us. First of all, thank you very much to the IL for inviting me. And uh, if you are from outside Singapore, greetings to you from Singapore. I would like to pick up on a point that Xiaofang had made earlier, and that is a lot of us as educators, whether we teach in schools, university, or in a professional setting or training, we already have some of the fundamental techniques in conducting a class. So what's very important here for online learning, and my presentation is just limited to the real-time learning, the synchronous component, it's very important that we think very hard about some of the techniques that we have already been using for many years. So it's in this regard that I'm going to start my presentation in a moment. So if you could just bear with me, I'm going to share the screen right now. I have one key takeaway for my presentation, and it's quite a simple one. You have to start for your online class with the end point in mind. That is, what is your end goal? In other words, if you want your student, you are a trainer. Let me just go back to that. It's running ahead of me. What is your end goal? For example, if you are a trainer for a workshop and it's a subject matter that requires a lot of application, tactile or kinesthetic learning, you have to ask yourself within the time that you're given, what can you realistically achieve during this online class? If you're conducting another class which is not so hands-on, are you hoping to seed an idea in your student or participant when this student leaves your class at the end of three hours? four hours, for eight hours, whatever it is. Or if you're conducting a class like mine over 13 weeks, but every class per week has a self-contained topic, is it your goal to make sure that the student leaves the class with some sense of how we can apply the concept that I have already taught asynchronously elsewhere? So it's very important that you think about the end goal that you want to achieve. And you might think this is an obvious point, but it's obvious, but I suggest it's not that easy to do well. Why? Because as subject experts, we think that everything we know needs to be taught in that class. But you can't do that in three hours, four hours, eight hours. It's quite important that you curate in a very disciplined sense and you ask yourself a truthful question. What can I realistically achieve during this online session that I'm conducting? So you have to think in relation to the time that's allocated to you and also the size of your class. So that's one thing that I really hope I can uh, convey at the end of this sharing. So that's the end point. When you have identified your end point, then the next thing that you really need to think hard about is the cognitive gain. In other words, if you feel that your subject matter has a few learning goals, what is the one specific learning goal that is indispensable to your class? In other words, for example, in my class, it's very important that my students can leave the class with some sense of how the concepts or the rules can be applied to real life scenarios, the authenticity as Xiaofang had talked about just now. Now, once you have identified the cognitive gain, that is the peak of the learning for that class, and everything else will be worked backwards. 
that's when you start thinking about the activities that you want to conduct in your class. That's when you think about which ad tech technological platforms I want to use, et cetera, et cetera. The rest of them are just the processes. I suggest to you that the most important thing is to start with the end point. What exactly do you want to achieve? When you've attained that goal, can you actually achieve it within the time that's given to you? That's a little harder uh, than one suggests because I struggle with this on a weekly basis for my classes. There are some trade-offs that you need to make and that depends on your experience and also your judgment call as an educator. Once you have identified the metacognitive gain, then the next thing is you should create a lesson plan. And that is the lesson plan for the real time learning, the synchronous part of your learning. So please allow me uh, to show you some examples. My sharing will primarily be anecdotal. I'm gonna show you some examples of how I conduct my classes. There are two types of classes that I teach at SUSS. I teach a lot of classes uh, within a law school. Those are law classes, and they typically run for 13 weeks or six weeks, but every week is a self-contained topic. On the other hand, I also do professional courses where they run for four hours and I don't see the participants again. And the nature of those students are quite different. So they can range from the C-suite to executive level. So that raises some pedagogical issues about are you pitching your learning goals appropriately for this range of participants for the professional course? So these are the two type of courses that I teach at SUSS. And I'm gonna start with one example of what I do. Now, my handwriting is atrocious, so you're not expected to make sense of uh, what I have written here, but this is a notebook I keep and work on weeks before my classes start. Now, this is the skeleton of the learning materials. In other words, this is the asynchronous component of an online course. What I have done here is to extract the structure of the learning material and also the learning goals which are declared by the university. Now, this was a 10th class for a 13 week class. SU stands for study unit. And for this particular week, I cover two big topics, defamation and false representation. You don't need to know what it is, but there are two big topics inside this learning material. So weeks before, I have really distilled the structure of the learning material, and I looked at the learning goals in the learning material very importantly. Why do I show you this? Because it's very important that for the online class that I'm conducting, apologies, there's a bit of a lag on my side, so you're seeing things belatedly. Now, it's very important that I do not just spend time talking about recollecting or recollecting content. I will use my real-time learning for application and analysis. So I looked at the structure, I looked at the learning goals, and I decided that for the metacognitive side of my class, which is at the bottom part of your screen here, I will focus during my class on defamation only on application. How do I do that? I will use examples to contextualize the rules which they should have read already in the learning materials during my online class, real-time learning. So that is the notes I've taken. But hours before my class, what I do is I prepare a lesson plan. So please allow me to show you. I like to use handwritten notes. And what happens here, let me just give you a caveat. So this is not a lesson plan to the standard of a teacher's college, no. It's not that, but it's a frame of reference where I know exactly what's gonna happen during my online class. Now, it's very important that you're able to visualize the steps and the sequence of your class. Xiaofang mentioned much earlier that in an online class, we have to encourage interaction and the teacher should not dominate the session. That's true. But in an online space, it's very important for the participants and the students to get a sense that someone is pacing the learning. Someone is controlling the virtual space. Why is that important? 
It's important because you want to create the same safe space for learning that we know is very important for interaction in a face-to-face -face context. So the visualization of your lesson plan in your mind is very important. This is an example. Before my class starts, I actually would memorize my entire lesson plan and write it out for memory because this forces me, which works for me, to know what is the sequence. So the details of my lesson plan here is how I start the class. You have to be a 120% version of yourself on normal day. Why? Because my classes starts at night. It starts at 7 p.m. My students are tired. They just came from work. So you are also tired as a teacher because it's already seven. I had a long day, but you can't show your exhaustion. So even the visualization, your energy level, which has to be conveyed through a camera, you need to visualize that and project it through a camera to your students with anywhere else. So this kind of lesson plan for me is very important. And I will tell the students, because it's a virtual space, this is how I'm carving out my class. That's an overview. And you see references here, Paul EV and also the Kahoot. So these are the activities. But if you look at how I have broken down, sorry about that. Um, the slides are running ahead of me. I'll just go back to it. If you look at the way that I have broken up my lesson plan, I actually try to memorize every sequence of the steps. In other words, for my activities, which I'll explain in more detail in a moment, for my activities, I always start off with something easy, just to give them a sense that you are in control of your learning. Usually they relate to understanding or recalling certain things that they have read in the learning materials. But I ratchet up and intensify the cognitive gain towards the end by the fifth or the sixth exercise, where it's quite a laborious, active application of the rules to a certain example. And of course, uh, giving small breaks during an online class is very important. It gives them that time just to decompress as well. So I have found that the visualization of my entire class, which I write down to be quite important, for my face-to-face -face class, I do visualize them, but there was never a need for me to write it down because all I have to do is to visualize it in my mind. And when I go into class, I respond accordingly to the nonverbal cues of my students. But in an online class, it's much harder. And the way you pace and sequence your online class has to be very purposeful and deliberate. So that's one thing that I do. Please allow me to show you how I scale learning goals. And that is how I suggest a one way in which the engagement can be sustained. Now, this is a class for the professional certification. And for this class, I teach fundraising. The cognitive gain in this particular class I teach on fundraising for charities in Singapore is this. They must be able to crystallize the brand identity of that charity and to be able to identify the donor motivations of their association. So if you look at the way that I have designed the activities in my class, you'll find that I scale the learning goals from basic recollection or description to application. Now, these activities are not conducted cons uh, consecutively. I would do a bit of teaching because this is only a four hour class. And in between the teaching, I will test their recollection, whether they have been able to understand and recall the concepts. Then we move to some application. Then after that, there's a break. And I start to intensify learning goals here where it becomes a little more challenging. And uh, this learning circle is a breakout group exercise where you have to analyze a certain activity that I have designed. I'm gonna talk about this in a moment. And the last stage of the class goes back to an individual reflective exercise. Having learned the concepts, having tried an application in a group setting, how will they take away whatever they have learned in relation to their own charities, in relation to identifying their brand identity and also the donor motivations of their charity. So this is how I do purposefully scale 
the difficult the difficulty of the learning goals. Let me show you the peak of my methods cognitive uh, learning for this particular professional class. This at this point the class will peak in terms of my learning goal, which I've designed for it. And that is, I want them to learn, not by understanding it, but to ask more questions in relation to the concept. I think some of you uh, in this virtual space will be familiar with this approach called the question formulation technique. The QFT is quite established. It can be used in a primary school. It can be used in a secondary school. It can be used at a university. And of course, it can be used for adult training as well. What's very important about the QFT, the question formulation technique, is that it can be used as an individual exercise online, or you can use the breakout room as a group activity. For this class that I teach, I blend both. It starts off as an individual exercise. They have to ask questions. And then we move into a breakout group. The asking of questions has two functions. One, it forces the students to recall what they have learned that morning for my fundraising class. And it converges into this question prompt that you see on your screen here. The second purpose of the QFT as a form of interaction is it helps them to think about what other factors must be present before the concepts we have learned that day can be successful. To put this more practically, what are, what are the missing factors in their own charities that they need to address before they're able to find more funds for fundraising? One of the caveats for using a QFT that I use quite often in my classes is the role of the facilitator. The question prompt that you see here is vital to the success of the QFT. In other words, if you don't choose your QFT question prompt correctly, the entire exercise will fail. Why? You must choose a prompt, not necessarily with words. You can use a picture, you can use a video, or you can use a photo, but it must be sufficiently vague but at the same time, it must have enough content for the students to ask questions. This is why it's very important that you crystallize your end goal. What is the most important learning outcome in that class? So here I chose this prompt and it forces the students to think about what are the missing donor motivations in their own charities. So the facilitator is very important and you need to rehearse and visualize this as a facilitator to ensure the success of this particular exercise. But I use this at the end of my class. Final slide I have for you before I conclude my sharing. I'll go back to my law classes. And again, it's the same concept I scale my learning goals, but this is where I start talking about the ad tech platform. You realize I haven't talked about which tools to use because my view is that if you have not crystallized what are your learning goals, particularly the most important ones, the platforms are not that important. In this particular exercise on passing off, now let me just try to explain this. So it's in some ways related, it's more serious than a trademark infringement. It's quite a complex topic to teach. And I find that Kahoot in this case is quite useful. Why? Because one of the goals I have for them, a low level learning is this. If you look at number two, the arrow should appear now. Kahoot has this feature where you can shuffle as part of a puzzle. So you shuffle the options in relation to the question I've asked. And this is a very useful tool in Kahoot because my learning goal here is I want the students to be able to form a connection. In other words, my learning goal here is an understanding level. I want them to form connections between the concept that they have read in the case law to the elements of the law which they have read in their learning material. So there are two sources of learning materials. I want them to join them, and this is a form of understanding. So using Kahoot Shuffle was very helpful for me, and I used the platform because I, I was quite clear about my learning goal. If you look at the last exercise, number six, sorry about that, let me go back to it. Number six, 
the reference to Night Timber. Night Timber is an English uh, sparkling wine. And this example is a useful one because as Xiaofang has shared with us much earlier, it's quite important that you use examples that your participants or your students can relate to either in their daily lives or their professional lives. And you pique their interest that something I see in the supermarket actually the rules I learned that evening has application. By doing so, you actually inspire your students to start looking at the phenomena around them, both in their daily lives, and of course, the professional lives and ask, oh, this concept that I've learned in class, how can I then try to apply? So that kind of cognitive gain was my objective for uh, my classes. And on that note, I'm going to stop my sharing. I'm very happy to take any questions that anyone has. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Daniel. That was really amazing. I love your laser focus strategy. I mean, begin with the end in mind and get there. So um, everyone, your questions are coming in and they are amazing questions as well. And there's some of them being upvoted. So Daniel, what we're going to do is we're going to not take any questions for you now. Because sure. We need to jump first to speaker three. And sure. everybody, please, please, um, thank you so much for your questions. We are going to get to them, as many as we can. But we'll begin looking at the questions after Mr. Pambudi has shared his thoughts with us. So thanks again, Daniel. Coming back to you shortly, yeah? Um, so everybody, we are now um, swiftly moving on to Mr. Pambudi. And uh, he is joining us. And he has got rich stuff to share from industry. So how is this learning shaking up industry out there? We'd love to hear from you, Mr. Pambudi, um, whenever you're ready. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. First test, can you hear my voice? Thank you. Uh, can I start to share my slide, please? If the admin can give me the right uh, to share. If the previous presenter can stop the sharing. Thank you, Mr. Pambudi. So Daniel, could you, would you uh, stop sharing your slides so Mr. Pambudi could share his? Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Sorry, Daniel, I know you're facing a, a lag, so thank you for that, yeah. Can you see my, oh, sorry. Can you see my slide? It says learning engagement more than yes. just fun. Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay, let's see. Uh, we will talk today uh, from the industry perspective uh, how the learning will shape uh, the talent management overall uh, and the business performance uh, in general. So hence, I put here the picture of two hands together in the sense that uh, the training uh, should not be disconnected. It has to be connected to the business agenda. Therefore, if we are doing the training right, the business performance must increase significantly. That will be the goal of my uh, learning today. A quick introduction of my role, uh, I'm Indonesia. Uh, as you can see, uh, I shift my career from the computer industry uh, uh, to the uh, HR. Uh, so I study in France in computer science, got my master degree in artificial intelligence. Uh, then after that, I got my MBA from Helsinki School of Economics. Uh, I learned a lot of HR career in Nokia days. Uh, and after that, when I came to Indonesia, after uh, some uh, uh, exposure and experience in Singapore, China, and Germany. I moved back to Indonesia. Uh, on 2013, uh, I led the HR function for Citibank in Indonesia. After that, I went to Danone Aqua. And now here I am uh, as the HR director of Bluebird Group, uh, as the leading transportation company in Indonesia. We are in the middle of the transformations. 
Now, this is our challenge today. And uh, our challenge today is represented here by this picture, beautifully painted by Rembrandt in one of the very famous uh, uh, museum in Paris. And as you can see over there, our youngsters, our millionaire generation, they don't know, they don't care so much. And this is representing HR as well as the training industry. We are developing a lot of training content. The question is, is this relevant for the industry? We are developing great content. The question is, do we inspire our talent and our future generation to learn and to use it in the best way possible? We are living in not only in a VUCA world, we are living in an extremely VUCA world. Everybody know the meaning of the acronym VUCA. By now, the word VUCA is an understatement. The change continuously and become faster and faster. I give you here just an example that is happening in the hospitality industry. We used to have all those beautiful hotel that we proudly announced uh, three star, four star, five star. The classification is being destroyed by our group from France. They refuse to be fall into that trap. They have their own category, Ibis, Mercure, Novotel, and so on. Then come the Hotel Formula One, where in the beginning when they did it in Europe, the hotel did not have any employee. What a disruption, hospitality and services. Uh, but they went already everything digital, no employee needed in the hotel. Before even we wake up and we realize what is happening to us, we have Agoda, where anybody can book their own hotel from internet or mobile phone. That's the death of the tourism agency or traveling agency. Before we know what is happening, Airbnb is coming. You don't need any more to go to the hotel. Everybody can rent their own room. Before you realize again, come home, it changes. I am from Indonesia and I can go to Bangkok and I can stay in one home in Bangkok, we exchange the change that we are facing. As I learned, pace of speed inside you is slower than the speed of change outside you. That's the sign of death. That's the challenge that we are all facing. Can we afford that? The concept is still the same. Highly engaged employee drive customer loyalty and customer loyalty drive long-term success. A lot of people understand we need to take care of the upper part, but do we have a strong foundation in the bottom? And that's what we are also trying to achieve with the training. Training is not only meant to develop the people, but also to improve and increase the engagement level, hence bring customer loyalty and the long-term successes. <coughs> Suddenly, a lot of terms that previously we have in HR become, become ambiguous, become more complex. Are we still recruiting? Are we still developing? Are still going motivating? Are still we retaining? The key issue is inspiring, inspiring, inspiring. Do we inspire our talent? If we inspire our talent, don't worry. They will be engaged, they will stay alert, and they will perform at the maximum level. That's the question that all of us need to ask. The world is changing, digitalized world everywhere coming. This is just an example sir, where an artist sir, come and show his latest movie. My apologies, there is a very uh, Heavy disturbance of noise. Can you hear the noise? Yes, we can. But we can hear you louder, so that's important. Okay. Yeah. If it is okay, I need to put a break and move to another room. My apologies for that. 
I will try to uh, avoid that disturbance. Just wait two minutes, I will be with you. Hi, everybody. So uh, perhaps we didn't mention it earlier, but uh, Mr. Pambudi is um, joining us from Indonesia in between some meetings. So uh, that's why we had to pause uh, on questions for Daniel a little bit earlier. So for now, whilst we wait for him to relocate to a quieter space, um, perhaps uh, maybe, yeah, let's not lose any time. Daniel, I'm going to ask this question, which you know the audience has asked. If you have a huge group, Daniel, for example, a huge group of more than 50 learners, what are some, um, and this is synchronous learning, of course, what can you do to keep them engaged? I know it's a quick question, but perhaps um, would you mind sharing a little bit of what you do? Because you probably have a huge, uh, huge classes at SUSS. Yes, uh, my classes at SUSS are quite small, but the professional classes I teach is about 80 students. They're about the size of participants that we have tonight uh, here right now. So what you have to do, the short answer is you need to pace your teaching and activities. In other words, if you teach for five minutes, you must stop and there has to be some kind of kinesthetic activity, maybe a poll, for example, to ask them to describe something that we just covered. And then you go back to the teaching. In other words, online teaching, if you want to sustain the energy level mm -hmm. and by extension, the engagement, it requires a lot more work. So you do need to stop uh, and have the discipline to stop and then do some activities, a short one, a poll, and go back to the teaching. So that's my short answer. Excellent. Makes perfect sense. Thank you so much. Maybe we can talk some more later on. Thank you so much, Mr. Pambudi, for moving. So perhaps we could continue with you now. Yes? Great. Now can you hear me again now? Beautifully. Excellent. And can you see my slide now? Yes, we can. Excellent. Thank you very much. Apologize for that inconvenience. Okay, let's continue. The world is changing. The digitalized world is everywhere. The change of behavior happen. This means, are we able to adapt? The attention span of our future leader getting shorter and shorter. If in the past, in the old days of training, we conduct the training for three days, we prohibit our participants to not hold their mobile phone. Can we still afford to do that? We know that our future leader, our millennial generation cannot live without touching their mobile phone for five minutes. Something needs to be changed while still being relevant, but at the same time, change the way we conduct our trainings to reflect the change that is happening in the business and the change that is happening in the mind, head, and heart of our time. The good news, the training will still be very, very relevant. We can still conduct this uh, for the best interest of the business and the talent development. The five things that they need in a job. Number one, they value the purpose over the patients. What is no longer sorry sorry mr pambudi i'm so sorry to interrupt but i think the audio quality seems um seems a bit diminished um would you mind perhaps um trying this with your video of uh, yeah of, uh, then the boss to be able to... if okay. you could turn your video off and keep talking perhaps that will give us uh, improved audio quality I change my Wi-Fi. Can we? Can you hear me now? Yes, we okay. can. Let's try this one first, uh, and then after okay. that, if it is, uh, uh, if there is other problem, uh, uh, okay, good, good point. I will also disconnect my video. Okay, can you still hear me? Yes, perfectly. Excellent. Okay, good. They want coach, not boss. What does it mean? The development agenda play very high priority uh, in the head of our talent overall. Regular feedback is important and uh, the mobile learning uh, is needed. The work-life cohesion will drive uh, the demand uh, for more and more mobile content to be learned. Millennial, we keep talking about them, 
what do they want? After working uh, in three or four different company in five or six different countries, uh, in the end of the day, it is true. Money is no longer number one, but what are they? They are looking for the company with great vision, great purpose. They want a company, they want an organization that they are very proud of. That's number one. Number two, they want the opportunity to develop in their career journey. The opportunity to do something meaningful that would help them to develop in the future. They want incentive, obviously. While I'm talking about all the stuff, it does not mean that money is not important. Money is still important. It's one of the consideration that they will consider. They want community. They want cool company that they are proud of. They want uh, the boss that is taking care of them. They even ask the question, how Instagrammable is your office? This is a generation of showing off. Uh, they want to take a picture in their office. They want to take a picture with their boss and they want to show off with their friend. Entrepreneurship. They want to have the entrepreneurship uh, skills. Hence, uh, we need to equip them with the different competence, with the different skills. Also provide the job rotation uh, that will bring them uh, to become a better leader. Finish the days uh, where they are stuck in their career for the rest of their life doing the same thing in one function. I am a living example. I start as an engineer, project manager, trainings, uh, then managing the talent uh, function, and now here I am a HR director. So people need things. People need to be rotated up. People need to learn something new every day in their life. What did we learn from the learning? Training objective is still the same, to keep, develop, and reward the talent. Remember, there is a word reward. Hence, the experience must be wonderful that our talent, when they attend our learning, they must feel as a reward, not a punishment. Investment in training and development remains strong. The leadership and managerial training is still the most common type of training. We invest a lot on that. Not because of the leader drive productivity. Hence, a lot of company, while they are promoting people with strong technical skills or hard skills, they need to equip them with leadership and managerial training. Training and development methods are evolving. We need to be much more innovative than before. Training and development drive the result. We need to really take care that there is a link between the training and the business agenda. Let's be innovative. We have all the weapon. Sometimes we miss innovation, we miss imagination. Sometimes we are like handymen who will, bring, who will just bring the screwdrivers uh, or the uh, the screwdriver or knife uh, to the home and then try to uh, fix everything with one problem. Remember, we have all these type of activity. Let's make sure we use all of them. In the end of the day, the business don't care how we train our people. They care that uh, our talent learn a lot, perform much better, and improve the productivity along the way. This is uh, some examples uh, that we are applying uh, when we are doing this. Learning during the recruitment. When we conduct the recruitment, we already make our participant learn. As part of our recruitment campaign, we educate them, we train them about our industry, about our company, about the way we operate and the culture that we are in. Recruitment process. Make sure that the participant don't feel that it is just a process that the company selected. From the top talent perspective, it is a mutual selection. From the talent perspective, not only the company must choose the employee, but the talent also must choose the right organization they want to put, they want to work for. How to do that? Put company message and key learning point in our campaign process. Learning induction. Hey, the learning induction went great. I'm sure 
A lot of company do it. But what does it mean learning induction? Learning induction means, uh, hey newcomer, you are all very smart. We hire you because we are smart. But now that you join us, shut up and listen to us. Then we hear all the old generation, the HR, the business leader, keep talking and breaking about how great was the company. What sometimes we didn't realize was we hire people with great experience. Suppose in average five years of experience. Suppose you hire 20 people in a month. What does it mean? It's five times 20, 100 years of experience that you have in the room. And do you use that? No, because we ask them to shut up and listen. We ask them to do induction program. Why don't we do reverse? Hey, this time, let the new guy talk and let all of us others hear to them. Prohibit induction program, perhaps put everything on internet or mobile phone, but learn from the newcomer. Create a cross-learning project where people can learn each other, know each other better, and teach each other the complementary skills that they have. Similar with coaching. Hey, the millennial are great. They are smart. They are much more connected. They are digital. Any information you want, they will get it at the finger. Now, why don't we do reverse coaching? Why don't we let the, the millennial, the youngster, coach the CEO with the digital marketing strategy, for example? So the mutual learning will come, but at the same time, uh, they feel more privileged, uh, they feel more respected, uh, and they will feel this is the great company I'm proud to work for. Learning by doing. One day in the field, send your people selling something. I'm a chair, but sometimes, time to time, uh, I still have to meet my customer and sell my products. Feel the pain of others. Or learn by doing someone else's job. Open your horizon. Sometimes there is a feedback. The HR is sitting in the corner, not knowing what is happening in the business. Ask the HR to do the business job for one, two, or three months. And ask the marketing job, the marketing people, to do the HR job for one, two, or three months. That's some of the thinking that is usually happening in the industry. And unfortunately, most of the time did not come across into our mind. My challenge to you is, uh, are we ready for this? The world is changing. The business is changing. Are HR people ready to change? And especially, are the training professionals like us ready to change? Why? Remember, when the speed of the change inside you is slower than the speed of sight, of the change outside you, that's the sign of the gap. Remember, leadership is lead yourself, lead your team, and lead your business. It starts from us. It starts by leading by example. Hence, the term developing your business can never be completed if you don't develop your team, but at the same time, the first and sometimes the most important thing we need to do is also develop ourselves before we develop our team and before finally we develop our business for long-term success for the organization. My name is Pangudi. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm glad to take some of your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Pambudi. That was truly inspirational. And I think I'm not the only one who feels that that was inspirational. Um, lots of, of lessons in there. And if we think that everything that us, we, we as adult educators do is really the end goal is to get people jobs. And here you are talking about the power of jobs and purpose and millennials and what motivates them. And then how should we change the way we train. So I'm going to jump over to a question um, and I'm going to read it. Um, it's Jeffrey Ong's question. So this is a question, Mr. Pambudi, and this one is for you. I really resonate with Pak Pambudi's call to inspire people. Does Pak Pambudi feel what inspires the different generations might be different? And if yes, 
how does he generalize policies or maybe strategies to inspire the different generations? Thank you. Wow, your word is, uh, your question is great. I like it very much, thank you. Uh, it is true that the generation is different, but at the same time, don't generalize people. Millennial is not a factory where we produce all the human being with exactly the same specifications. Millennial is a label that we are giving to them. Well, sometimes we forget that they are also human. That they are also trying to be different and finding their own identity. So the key to that is still the concept that is very classic. And the reason why they are classic is because they are the best and they are relevant across the time. Situational leadership. What does it mean, sir? You adapt your style according to the situation, according to your audience. Sir. The best way the leader can lead and inspire if they know their people, mm -hmm. if they spend time with them, if they understand them, and if they can help them. So remember, in the end of the day, inspiring doesn't mean giving great talk but it means helping them in the career journey, help them, them, helping them to be more successful in the job. So how to do that? The policy, yes, of course, it has to be existed, but we need to be much more flexible. That's the reason why I put the picture of Rembrandt in the beginning, mm. because it's great, but maybe nobody cares. The medical benefit, which is very good package for three children, Maybe it's great, but the millennials don't are not even married and they don't even have three kids. Some of them don't want to be married. Seriously, they tell me, but I don't want to be married. Why are you giving me a medical benefit for three children? Mm. We give great <laughs> company policy. They don't want to drive. Jakarta is traffic jam. They want to take the MRT now that we have MRT. We have no, they want to take the taxi or the online uh, uh, transportation. So they don't care about the car anymore. So remember this, understand them, helping them. What mm -hmm. does it mean? Finish the deal where you have the policy, one size fits all. Everything customized, customized, customized. That's how you build a great ex employee experience. Thank you. Thank you for that, Pa. Thank you so much. I'm um, very aware that you have to leave us soon, and I don't think I can see any other question for you, but I'm wondering if Daniel or Xiaofang, perhaps you have a question for, for Pa Pambudi you might want to ask now. Daniel, perhaps I see you moving, yes? Um, pa, thank you very much for your sharing. Um, I was quite intrigued and I agree with you that the customization of the experience for the millennials and even beyond the millennials in future is, uh, is a huge challenge because uh, speaking from my own experience, the law profession is quite structured. But one of the biggest challenges right now is to accept that the young lawyers who are entering the profession have very different expectations of how practice should be done. So I don't have a question so much, Parveen, as uh, a concurrence with uh, Park Pambudi, that the customization is a huge challenge, particularly for certain professions which are quite entrenched in a certain way of operation. So thank you very much for the insight, Park. Thank you very much. You it know, uh, but, sorry, you were going to say something I interrupted. Yes, uh, I worked in Citibank before. Citibank banking industry of, is highly regulated. But at the same time, the innovation and the customization is still the way to go. Mm. We understand which area that we cannot touch, but we also need to find out the how part, the way of working that we can still combine. So banker life can be fun, the same as lawyer life can be fun if we know how to do it. Mm. But if you make everything 100% rigid and inflexible, your young lawyer will leave. Believe me, but the same go with the bankers. So it's a matter of combining as customizing which area you cannot touch, mm -hmm. but which area you still can play around. My city bank office look like kindergarten. 
because I put flower and everything, uh, colorful, red, uh, yellow, and everything, and they love that. My regulatory don't care. They just want the process to be followed, but I provide them the right environment. Mm -hmm. I provide them the right to choose uh, whether they want to have a good medical health, or if they are very healthy, choose it for the fitness uh, or for the fortune, for traveling or everything. So remember this, uh, there are some parts that has to be complied, I fully understand. Lawyer, banking industry, same. Uh, mm -hmm. There are other parts that can be fun and customized. Thanks so much, Pa. Drawing lessons from what you've just said, I can see a lot of what you're doing out there in the real world has lessons for us in our classrooms. So for example, you know, it's not the teacher who is the wisest person who's talking, it's really sharing the space so that there can be that reverse coaching or that sharing so that we have different generations in our classrooms because our classrooms are 20 year olds, 60 something year olds. We have the different generations coming in to share this reverse coaching and mentoring that you talked about. So many lessons that you are doing right there at workplace learning we really need to emulate you know ourselves in the classroom so um can that... i share one final story one last story i promise you after that i'm leaving so. okay <laughs> this is the gap that is happening between the millennials uh, and the other generation one big company in indonesia the ceo talked in front of 200 million future leaders mm -hmm. in the middle of the speech the ceo spot someone who is playing with their mobile phone is typing something. Being the traditional generation CEO, he is very angry and he's called the guy. Hi, I am the CEO. I'm talking and you are typing. Show some respect. The millennial said, wow, I thought your voice, does your speech was great. I share this in my Twitter. All my friends love it. Mm -hmm. I have thousands of people saying that's great. Your CEO must be great. I want to work for your companies. You are so lucky to work there. But if you want me to stop, by all means, I can put my mobile phone in my pocket. Mm. That's the story. And I think all of us understand the world that we need to change. Mm. A lovely story. Thank you so much, Pa. You've given us many things to think about, yeah? Yeah. I'm going to, we've got, I think, 15 minutes left, everybody. And I'm so pleased to have so many in the audience and so many rich questions coming up. So we're going to go to some questions. The same question came up a few times. And this one's for you, Daniel. And it's about, um, you know, I love what you mentioned about the strategic thinking and planning and beginning with the end in mind and the lesson planning. And it doesn't have to be like teacher kind of lesson planning, but you have this laser focus outcome that you want them to achieve. And you, you create this pre-work, pre-class pre learning, et cetera. So we all know, we've all been there. We've, we've um, carved this beautiful pre-work and then some people don't do it. How do you manage that? And how do you handle those kinds of scenarios? So I just, uh, thank you very much for the question. And thank you, Paveen, for that. It's a very important question. I saw the chat box just now. I just want to stress that all the students I teach, I teach are working adults. Mm -hmm. And when they enter the class at seven, and usually they're quite late, they come in at 7.30 in, in between the teaching, they are not prepared for class. That is a fact in the type of uh, classes that I teach. So what I'm trying to suggest here is that the way you cut up your class is this, even though I have given them the asynchronous components in a form of one, two minute videos, aside from the text, they don't have time to read. So it's very important that when you start the exercises in my classes, the law classes, there is very little teaching. And precisely because there's a range of students who are very prepared and there is a large number who are not, so the scaling of the learning goals are very important. You need to start at the baseline where even a student who is minimally awake during your class can answer that. So you need to give the students like that some confidence that, okay, I'm not quite prepared cognitively today, but the facilitator is trying to embed me in the learning process. They can tell. Now, you try to scale it up. You realize that they can't do so. For my classes, they are very small, so I co-call every student. 
throughout the two and a half hours to three hours. I make a point to call everyone at some stage for equity. Now, this is the point where you need to be very alert. You can try to push them a little bit. Sometimes it works very well. Sometimes you know the student is not quite there and you have to let it go and tell them, perhaps I can come back to you at the end of this class or next week I can come back to you again. If we do have that kind of class. So to answer your question, how do you deal with that? You need to unpack your classes into smaller parts. Some of your activities have to be quite basic where even those who are not minimally prepared for it can answer them. You create a safe space in that sense. That's how I try to do it. Mm. Sounds like you, you're, you're aware of equity, you're aware of not making them feel embarrassed, uh, you're reaching out to them, you're making bridges. There's a lot of uh, hardware um, in there. And I like the way you mentioned earlier, you don't really worry about the platform because these things in the end are more important for, for learning. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, Sia Fang, there's a question here. Uh, someone's interested in, uh, perhaps you could dive into your research because someone's interested in um, the modality. So when you were looking at um, your, your, I think you saw sort of the question, right? Yes. Did you elicit the advantages and disadvantages of different modalities? So if you could zoom in a little and maybe share yeah. some light, please. Yeah. Yes. yeah, I saw this question. Actually, it's a very good question. And I also want to uh, resonate on the Daniel's points. I, uh, uh, when we look at the modality, uh, if it can help us to achieve the learning outcome, I, I mean, we don't look at the modality itself. Actually, my research is more, uh, for example, on the blended learning. I, I will look at how these different modalities could be integrated together to help the learners achieve their learning outcome. So that means that I also put the end goal in my mind. So at the end of the course, what you want to achieve, who you want to become, and what kind of professional skills you want to pick up or learn from this course. Mm -hmm. So then come back to the modality, Okay, so for example, for the asynchronous online learning, for these parts, how can, how, can this, how can I design this part to achieve the angle? For classroom teaching, like, like uh, has, uh, uh, Daniel has shared, he, he, he went into very detailed, like the cognitive levels elicited to the detailed lesson plan and the steps. And then, uh, for example, to engage those less um, motivated students, like uh, scaffolding, starting from the basic level to make sure they're on the same page to move forward bit by bit. Then at the end, they could be on the same page. So, I mean, all these are all together, we are serving the same, same goal. So, I, I wouldn't claim that um, uh, like there are some advantages or disadvantages of different modality. I would like, like how could we uh, design these different mod modalities together to ensure that the learners could learn what they expect to learn. Yeah, so for example, you have uh, in blended learning, we have classroom, we have uh, online learning, online asynchronous learning, and mm. sometimes even workplace learning. Yeah, so you must have a very clear purpose why you want to put this modality in, inside this course. Mm. And how do you want to design the elements in these modalities to achieve that goal. So that's my, why my research, why I'm focusing on the learner sense making. Actually, learner sense making is kind of learning experience and learning uh, process. There are different features of sense making regarding the cognitive levels, uh, similar like what Daniel has mentioned. Mm -hmm. To achieve the higher level of sense making, you must be very careful to carefully design those elements, different modality together. So in my research, I compare the uh, 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 six case studies of different blended learning with these uh, different components to showcase what is the high quality of uh, 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 blended learning experience. High quality means that learner at the end of the course, they are confident. They know what they have learned. They know what they can use to solve or, or, or tackle the, 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 the real uh, workplace problems. So these are the end outcome. Yeah, but for certain courses, like, like what I shared just now, they still feel lost. So how can I link this with my, my workplace practices, real scenarios? If they cannot make that links, I, I, I wouldn't say that's all because of the learning design. It has many factors, but as the training, I, as a practitioners, what we can do is to uh, maximize 
yeah, maximize the efficient, efficiency of this kind of uh, uh, learning design to achieve that goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for my research, you can easily search online from IL website. I have uh, published quite a few reports, uh, practitioner notes. Uh, actually, um, it's, it's much richer than what I can share today. And then you can really see uh, what, what other research findings there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Yafang. So I'm, I'm um, aware that we are now down to eight minutes that we have left. So I have in my head what's, you know, you, you talk about sense making, and then Daniel talk about, you know, strategy and goal and, you know, laser uh, focus precision as to what happens and what techniques he uses. So let's, let's bring it all back to our topic this afternoon, which is about engagement, right? And I know that, I mean, I think I'm not the only one here who believes that um, to, to make, to be engaged is more than to make sense. In my head, I see sense making as a subset of engagement, meaning that, yeah, we mm -hmm. understand what's going on, we can make connections, right? But yeah. to be engaged, I think there's a bit of that heart that, that Daniel is attending to, the equity, the sense of we're all here and we all belong and we all matter. Um, and, and I think what Daniel, you talked about is an activity later on where, you know, at the end of the day, something they learn is applicable to their lives, you know? So it's not just sense making up here, but it's whole being engagement, yeah? So I, I was wondering about, you know, how we could maybe talk about this because we clearly we don't lack tools and clearly we can be very uh, cognitive and engage, you know, but is, is that sufficient to help learners draw in and be fully engaged? so much that they are impacted by the learning and they retain whatever they experience and perhaps even they get transformed. So perhaps you could have a comment on that. Does, do you have any thoughts around this whole space? Be, be, before Daniel makes some comments, I just want to uh, <laughs> clarify a little bit the sense making is, mm -hmm. yeah, I understand you, 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 why you mentioned sense making, you think it's only happening in your, in your mind. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, the, uh, the, the sense making is defined differently in my research. It, the high level of sense making does uh, include this kind of application because mm -hmm. uh, at the outcome of sense making, you need to take actions. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's not just always thinking in your mind. So yeah, so I think my sense making or, or, or then use or cognitive levels actually are echoing with each other in a way yes, like yes. to achieve the same goal, right? <laughs> yeah. Because, Daniel's because when Daniel's learners go to a, uh, in the evening and go somewhere and see something and apply what they've learned in class, that's pure sense making, isn't it? It's an application. Yes, yes, yeah. Daniel, you were going to say something? Yes, I, I think uh, we all have a common landing, to be honest. And perhaps another obvious point is that ultimately teaching, training is a human connection. So you are making a human connection virtually as I am with everyone now. And it does not necessarily have to be an inferior form of human connection in a face-to-face -face context. Mm -hmm. You have to become comfortable as a facilitator online to make that connection. So you will have the advantage if you're able to meet your students over a period of time. Mm -hmm. But for the professional courses I teach, it's only four hours and I don't see them again. Now, the connection I suggest in relation to Parvin's point about engagement, I think comes from the authenticity of the case studies that you raise in class. Mm -hmm. It can have reson resonance with the students in terms of aha. Uh -huh. I don't necessarily relate to that specific example, but I can see how it relates to me. Please allow me to share. So in a context of the professional course, it's a fundraising course, and I'm involved in the arts, performing arts charities. I share some of the specific problems that we face as an arts company in raising funds. I tell them quite honestly that we succeed here, but there are problems that we are facing now. Mm -hmm. That degree of authenticity has resonance with the students. They see that ah, this person is not in a didactic position telling you how to do it. This person is sharing an experience, but is anchored in certain concepts. And we, based on our personal individual experiences, try to adapt with that. That's how I have tried to carve out my classes for the professional ones, where I don't see them 
after that class. And actually for the professional class, there are no in asynchronous materials. It's just that online class. And I think so far it's worked relatively well based on the quality of the case studies that you raise in class. There must be some traction and authenticity to their lives. Great, great, yes. I think if I could, I could start to summarize, and I'm not saying this is the end of our session today. You talked about bite size, activity-based, authenticity, relevance and application to daily life. There's one question here, which uh, has got quite a few upvotes. And um, it's about how do you engage, you know, uh, what would you recommend for larger groups of fifth learners, 50 and above, uh, during online synchronous sessions? So how can we engage them actively? Any difference or key strategies or techniques or tips? Daniel, I think this one could go to you again. Uh, yes, actually I addressed it in some form just now. So for a large class, and my class is the large ones by about 90 students, I am very conscious that the content, the teaching cannot go on beyond 10 minutes. I will do some lecturing, of course, because I don't see them after that. And I'll pause. I will move into one of my baseline questions on poll EV. I'll ask them, can you describe the motivations that we just talked about in relation to your organization? So there's a word cloud exercise and I elicit responses from specific participants in real time. Then I pivot back to the teaching maybe for two or five more minutes. And then I do a Zoom poll in relation to which donor motivation do you think does not apply to your organization? It's always aligned to the core idea I want to message throughout a class, mm -hmm. but you need to give the students an opportunity either to do something or to voice their views at a certain time. As I said, this requires you to think very hard about your sequence of your lesson plan. Mm -hmm. And you need to be completely in control of the sequence of your class. It's a little more time than a face-to-face -face class. That's how I've run a large class mm -hmm. of about 90. Yeah, I, I agree with Daniel, this kind of uh, uh, very uh, uh, deliberate planning beforehand for such sessions are very uh, important and necessary to engage such a big class. Yeah. yeah. And what I'm hearing as well is, it's not a matter of, how can I get 90 to 100 people to press a button to, do, to, to just keep doing? You don't want to just keep doing. You want to do meaningfully. Absolutely. Yeah, like, like uh, Daniel has mentioned the question techniques, like um, uh, when you uh, engage them, you, 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 you do need to ask those uh, thought-provoking questions to, to make them think harder. Yeah. yeah. It's also kind of engagement. And do you, do you also think of ways to make them feel harder? Because learning is beyond just thinking, right? Yeah. A, a true authentic response comes from more than just how we think. So how then can we get that kind of more holistic engagement? Yeah. Any thoughts? Because there's a question here talking about... Um, what is the panel's opinion that this disruption by the pandemic is a wake up call and an opportunity for our industry to build a capability in hardware as opposed to just hardware and software? Do you have an opinion, um, Xiafang, Daniel, on do we have this chance to do, to do and do differently and maybe do better with our online learning? I, I, I would take this as an uh, more than just a disruption. It's definitely an opportunity, not only for our training uh, sector, actually uh, for a lot of other sectors. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, a lot of things are changing. Yeah, I, 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 I personally uh, uh, feel that. So, um, so uh, it's, it's actually a good opportunity for the whole uh, TA sector to reflect on our practices, and then to make our uh, make make us to be more uh, prepared and uh, more uh, experienced when we have such kind of uh, like uh, uh, pandemic or any disruptions again. This is really a good uh, lesson for all of us, no matter for uh, I mean uh, which uh, any sectors. 
it's, it's there, there are always really a good lessons for us to learn. So for this uh, online learning at the beginning, I think everyone is quite, I um, uh, feel it's quite uh, sudden and then we, we have to make the changes. But now I think, I, I, I believe people are feeling differently. They are quite used to this kind of online learning. Mm -hmm. They are also not for the trainers, maybe for the learners, they are also adjusting themselves. So for example, for our working styles, we, as a lecturer at Daniel, I think you, you may not expect that you should conduct so many lessons uh, from home or <laughs> online. And then that, that forced us to think about the strategies, right? Like Daniel has shared the sequence, the steps to engage the learner, to make our, our uh, lessons more uh, as interesting as before, as, as uh, 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 in, engaging as before. So these are all, we are learning, we are growing. Mm. Maybe not, not so consciously, but we are doing that. So I think this is uh, beyond the hard, hard, hardware or software already. We are thinking through the whole process. How can we make sure our learners can still achieve the same level of achievement uh, in different modes of learning? Yeah, so um, I definitely believe these are good opportunities for us to step back and see, uh, learn new things and uh, uh, upgrade ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Daniel? <laughs> uh, yes, yes. I understand the question to mean because of this pandemic and after the pandemic, what are issues of equity and hence the hardware? I'm going to suggest something that I'm not sure everyone agrees with. I think the outcome here is not the pandemic itself. It's not going well in some parts of the world, but at some point it will ease and before we face another pandemic. But what I'm trying to say here is the intensification of technology that pervades every aspect of our life that is lasting. So that is, I think, the more important point that arises from this pandemic. It's a reminder that technology can increase our chances of succeeding, but the way we conduct our classes clearly illustrates that there are some issues of inequity because if it's an online class, for example, some of my students have to babysit their children at 7.30, feed them or tuck them into bed at 8.30. They miss out some parts of the class. So the question here as an instructor is then how do I address these kind of inequities that come about because online learning is now a fact in some context. Mm. The other question that we don't face so much in Singapore is the penetration, the internet penetration. It's not really an issue because we have access to them. But if you're conducting a class that aims to reach out globally to other parts of the world, this equity to internet is not universal in mm -hmm. some parts of the world. So that is, I think, one of the inequities that's exposed from this intensification of technology. The other issue, and I bring this back to Singapore, is this. For law, increasingly we are conducting a lot of hearings online. Mm -hmm. Now, what I observe as a teacher is that we need to try harder, this goes to hardware, that we need to message to our students who are adults that there's a certain etiquette that must be transposable from a face-to-face -face context to online. You cannot speak over someone you must allow someone to speak, someone in the virtual space wants to talk, how do we allow or permit this person to speak? So the virtual space, the non-verbal cues that we have taken for granted in a face-to-face -face context, we need to do better here. So I think technology in this broader sense exposes some of the structural problems in our society that as a teacher, I'm still reflecting on, to be honest. And I think that reflection is going to continue because we're only just beginning to address those kind of subtleties mm -hmm. that go way beyond technology. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Xiaofang. It's been really interesting to see different, you know, a multifaceted conversation. That's what we've just had this afternoon. Uh, really appreciate your sharing. And there's loads of, um, there's loads of thinking in both what you've shared and what part Pambudi has shared as well. So thank you everybody uh, for our afternoon together. I hope you are leaving with some new ideas about engagement um, in the online space.